So the foundation of humanism is really about treating other people fairly. We focus on other people as the source of meaning and worth. While we find the conventional ideal of the soul to be misguided, we do believe that each person is an independent moral agent with inherent dignity and an equal right to make and pursue their choices. We value freedom of moral judgment because we observe that those who claim moral leadership are often horribly wrong and are never perfectly wise. We value freedom of action because we observe that those who strive to control other people are often, are often abusive and are never perfectly good. As humanists, we willingly take on the, the challenges of the finer moral choices and the difficult dilemmas in life. However, sometimes moral, the moral judgment is obvious, but the correct action is what is difficult to figure out. The deprivation of a human being's freedom of choice and freedom of action. So I want to uh, uh, welcome uh, James Hatton. Uh, he's going to come. He's here to speak to us about human trafficking in New Jersey. Um, uh, James Hatton has been the director of youth services in Atlanta County. He's recently retired from that position. And he's uh, the vice president of the board of the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking. He's come to talk to us um, about how human trafficking reaches into every county of New Jersey. This topic is fundamentally disturbing, and Jim will not shy away from an honest description of the problem. So take this as fair warning that this program is likely to be disquieting, because that is really what it's intended to do, to stop us from being quiet about this abuse of our fellow human beings. So I hope you choose to stay to raise your awareness on the topic, and I want to give a warm welcome to Kieran Hedman. Thanks, Kieran. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Jim Hedman. I recently retired from uh, my position with Atlanta County Government as Director of Youth Services. Uh, most of the time in that position, I uh, was acting as the director of the youth shelter, runaway homeless shelter, and at that facility, on an average, we would um, work with anywhere from 15 to 30 victims of human trafficking every year. Uh, these are kids that were picked up by Vice Squad in Atlantic City, usually on Pacific Avenue. They came from all over the country. And back before the year 2000, we didn't have human trafficking. We called them hookers. And we treated them with kindness, and we gave them the night off, and we worked them through a court process and sent them home, very often back to the same situation they had already run away from, the same situation that created the trauma and the vulnerabilities to allow them to be trafficked. Um, I've identified bodies over the years. Uh, I've seen extreme violence. And human trafficking occurs in every county in New Jersey. Uh, very recently, the FBI uh, completed an investigation on a case in Rumson. The trafficker was not from Rumson, and the victim was not from Rumson, but the Johns, multiple Johns, the buyers that created the demand were all from Rumson. So it's alive and well in your community. Uh, I invite you to ask questions as we go, and I know we'll do question and answer period at the end, but uh, if you, if you want to raise your hand and ask questions as we go, please feel free. Um, so. Here are some recent arrests and stories of trafficking that's occurred around the state. And if I had a bigger slide, I could get every county on here. Okay. Uh, human trafficking, as I said, is has been growing in awareness 
and the numbers of trafficking cases keep growing. I don't know if it's because the problem's getting worse or because we're getting better at identifying it. But as I said, prior to the year 2000, we really didn't have human trafficking in this country. And in 2000, the law of the land changed. And we uh, passed the TVPA, the Trafficking Victim Protection Act, which basically changed our language and our perception of what prior to that had been just considered the world's oldest profession. And I will talk about primarily sex trafficking today because that's what I see and again working with kids, that's how they, they tend to be victimized. But we will touch on all forms of human trafficking, labor trafficking, child soldiers, uh, massage parlors, nail salons, restaurant work, organ trafficking, there's all kinds of human trafficking. You know, at the, uh, at the outbreak of the American Civil War, when slavery was legal in this country, there were nine million people involved in the transatlantic slave trade, legally. Today, where tra trafficking and slavery is illegal all around the world, there are approximately 35 million people enslaved through human trafficking. 35 million. That's worldwide? Worldwide. So, as I said, the language changed in the year 2000 and we began to become aware of, of the true uh, exploitation and coercion that takes place behind human trafficking. New Jersey followed up in 2005 with the State uh, Trafficking Victim Protection Act and in 2013, we passed the Prevention, Protection, and Treatment Act. I actually uh, participated in drafting that legislation. And New Jersey now has the strongest anti-trafficking set of laws in the nation. And, we are yeah. and, yet, and yet, we're working on more legislation right now. Because even though we have some strong laws on the books, they're not fully enacted. So we need to, to tweak it a little bit and, and get a little more action going. Um, but we now have a statewide victim services program that works with, I think they probably have close to 200 victims that they're working with right now around the state. That's a staff of 10. Um, and again, we continue to go around the state and raise awareness about what trafficking is all about and the reality of it. So what is human trafficking? Anybody? Forcing someone to have sex against their will, abducting children and, and uh, putting them actually into a slavery type yeah. of situation. Yeah, and that, that would be sex trafficking which is the most prevalent form of human trafficking, uh, along with labor trafficking. So there's a lot of farm workers that are, that are trafficking victims, lots and lots of uh, victims in massage parlors, hair salons, uh, nail salons. Um, yeah, a lot of those people, especially foreign nationals, uh, are being trafficked. But in this country, domestic minor sex trafficking, our kids are being trafficked in every school in this country, in this state. Boys and girls. Boys and girls. Um, the, the numbers for boys are growing again because uh, we're raising awareness and we're looking at it. Right now, I, I'd say 35% of sex trafficking victims are probably male. And um, those, those boys serve both men and women. Women are buying sex. 50% uh, of the boys' um, perpetrators, Jills, if you will, uh, are female. So it's not just men buying sex. Uh, it's women as well. 50%? 50% of the customers of male sex trafficking victims are females. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so 
human trafficking is a form of modern day slavery. It is certainly a violation of human rights. Uh, it's a crime everywhere. And, yeah, I mean, there's this horrible, it, it reaches genocidal proportions in different areas. I mean, there are some uh, Coptic Christian communities in Syria and Iraq that are just being completely wiped out by uh, ISIS and the women are just being sold off to the ISIS soldiers as sex slaves, as, as you know, arranged marriages. So there's absolute genocide taking place in the form of human trafficking in other parts of the world right now. So, fact. When you think about prostitute, I mean, what comes to mind? What do you think? Anybody? Yeah? I'm sorry? I think of a runaway girl. Okay. Anybody think of Julia Roberts? No? Okay. A lot of people do, and that's very, very far from the reality. Um, but again, back before 2000 when we had prostitution, not human trafficking, uh, we considered, you know, I mean, we didn't understand the dynamics of how a 14-year-old girl could find herself working on Pacific Avenue in Atlantic City. And we didn't understand the trauma and the exploitation that led her to that position. Uh, and we didn't understand that behind that is a pimp, a trafficker, that is controlling every moment of that girl's life. We didn't understand that she, she takes none of the money, none of it. It all goes to the pimp, and it's all about the money. And everything that pimp does and says is intended to coerce and control that kid. So, it's a myth that victims choose their lifestyle and live lavish lives. Uh, it's a myth that they're all adults. It's a myth that they can leave, they cannot leave. Uh, it is not a victimless crime. It's not involving consenting adults. Uh, and as I said earlier, pimps keep all the money, all the time. The facts are that there are 1.2 million kids being trafficked around the world every year. 35% uh, of boys, as I mentioned, and that may be a low ball number because we're not sure. Again, you know, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, uh, even though law enforcement agencies were beginning to look at the issue of human trafficking, they weren't looking at boys. And you weren't going to get, you know, a macho undercover cop to go try to solicit sex from a boy. They just weren't doing that. So that's the, they didn't look not. at that side of the problem. I'm sorry? Of course not. Yeah. Uh, they're doing it now. They're, they, they, they've matured. <laughs> you know? uh, and they're looking at more and more of it. One of those cases on that, that second slide I showed um, was the male prostitution ring that was busted down in, in Ventnor a couple of years ago. And what this guy did, the trafficker, is he, he had a bunch of guys that would come over to his house, young guys, 14, 15 years old. He'd give them all the alcohol they wanted. He would show porn continuously. And before he knew it, he had these guys drunk and horny. And they were starting to do sex acts with him and with one another. And he filmed it all. And once he had it on the phone, he had the means of coercion. And he could hire them out. And of course, once you turn your first trick, you know, you're nothing but a whore and that's all you're ever going to be. And you're caught, you're stuck, and you can't find a way out. And that's the kind of coercion that goes on all the time. There are estimated to be 100,000 to 300 domestic kids, our kids, at risk for trafficking annually in this country. I think the actual number is probably in the 150 range, but these are hard numbers to track and I've seen that data all over the place. But that's a lot of kids being trafficked around the country. And as I said, you know, 
I know the caseload for identified victims with our victim services program right now is around 200 in New Jersey just this year. I know that the uh, DCF, Department of Children and Families, hotline has received probably going on 500 uh, trafficking calls uh, in the last two or three years. Uh, so those numbers keep growing. <coughs> One in six runaways are likely to be trafficking victims, and 68, up to 80% of trafficking victims have some prior history with uh, Department of Children and Families. Okay, and that's part of the uh, part of the dynamic. Many, many, many of these kids have prior history of sexual abuse. Okay, and the story I hear, I've heard time and time again. When I was eight, my mom's boyfriend was molesting me. And when that came out, my mom chose her boyfriend and called me a slut, and I had to leave. And I went into foster care, and I felt like they only wanted me there for the money. And then I met my boyfriend when I was 11. My boyfriend was 32 years old. And he had a nice Cadillac and lots of bling, and he really loved me. And that was him. And one of the girls I'm thinking about, you know, 11, she was turned out when she was 11. And by the time she was 13 or 14, she's what, she was what we call the bottom bitch. That is the person that is sort of second in, in command of the stable or the family that the pimp creates. Uh, number of girls to work and yeah by 14 she was actually recruiting kids out of our runaway shelter again why runaway shelter because these kids are already runaways they've already suffered trauma in their lives and this is not simple trauma this is complex developmental trauma that leads these kids into the vulnerabilities that allow them to be trafficked Human trafficking is the second largest criminal enterprise on the planet behind only the drug trade. And it's growing because it's easier to traffic humans than it is to keep a supply line of drugs. Right? Because that kid that's been victimized isn't going to talk to law enforcement. She's been convinced that law enforcement is against her. If they just want to lock you up, that's all they're going to do. They're not going to help you. You know, They're going to lock you up or put you in another foster home. You don't want that. You know, If we can make some money together, we can get out of the hood. Where is trafficking occurring in New Jersey? As you can see, this, this map is from the Polaris Project National Human Trafficking Hotline. And so, those clusters are where the calls are coming from. You can see Bergen County, Essex County, Passaic County has got a lot of activity. That's the densest, most densely populated part of the state, very diverse. Lots and lots of strip clubs and places like that. Uh, and wherever you have any form of a legal sex industry, you're going to have that illegal trafficking activity going on sort of behind it or beneath it or whatever you want to call it. You can see a lot of activity uh, in the Camden area near Philly, and you can see that bright red cluster in Atlantic City. Why Atlantic City? Any idea? It's where the money is, right? So, can I say blowjob? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, a $50 blowjob on Admiral, Admiral Wilson Boulevard in Camden is a $300 blowjob in Atlantic City. So that's why pimps control all of the action. 80% of that action, by the way, is also gang-related. So the pimps are gang members. And, you know, so $50 in Camden, 300 in Atlantic City. The money's in Atlantic City. And people go to Atlantic City to party. And that's what's going on there. Do you know what the, yes? How, how much of, the, uh, of this is legal and how much is Law enforcement tells me, my friends in law enforcement, that 80% of the pimps they arrest 
have gang ties. Okay? Um, so I'm going to go with 80%. Uh, and the game is changing. The game refers to uh, the whole act of, of prostitution and sex uh, industry. Um, and that used to be street level. You know, it used to be Pacific Avenue was the stroll. And, you know, girls would walk up and down Pacific Avenue, you pull up in your car, and you you negotiate for a sex act. It's all moving to the internet. It's all on Backpage.com now. And so what we're seeing, I mean, in the old days, literally uh, a trafficking victim would, would be virtually kidnapped by the pimp. Although, again, they, they're going in the car voluntarily because they, the pimp says he loves her and says, I'm your boyfriend, and I'm going to help you get out of this mess you're in with DCF and foster care and shelters and group homes and all that stuff. No, we're going to be together forever. I love you. I'll always love you, and I will do anything for you. Will you do anything for me? And that's part of that coercion. Um, there's something we call guerrilla pimping that's going on more and more now. Uh, actually, since Superstorm Sandy, uh, a lot of people became homeless, and a lot of these kids tried to make money, wound up starting out trying to be independent, but again, it's gang-related. You can't work on my turf unless you work for me. So the pimps come in and take control and take all the money. And again, if you can see, it's happening all over the state. Um, and, you know, it's, it's real. But we're seeing kids that are working, we call them weekend warriors now. They're actually making it to school two or three days a week. And then Thursday they disappear for the weekend, and they'll come back on Tuesday with stories of great parties at the casinos or in the hotels. Um, I think there's a lot of action uh, down in Long Branch. Um, there's a lot of action in South Jersey. I'm more familiar with South Jersey. Mount Laurel is, there are more ads on Backpage for Mount Laurel than there are for Atlantic City, right outside of Philadelphia. And again, I'm not as tuned into the North Jersey side of things, but there's a lot going on. So who is vulnerable? Again, 70 to 85% of the time there's some prior history of child sexual abuse, some trauma, some connection with DCF, Kids get disconnected from school. Kids using substances are higher risk, although substance abuse is not primary because the pimps don't want to spend money on drugs and they don't want their workers being all messed up. They can't perform well. Although there was one pimp up in Jersey City named Prince who actually was a, a heroin dealer before he was a pimp and he found he could manipulate uh, his is stable by controlling the way he would distribute, and he got them all addicted to heroin, and then you know managed them through the way he, he portioned out the heroin that they needed to stay. Uh, you know. So you're using an acronym that I think is like the, the equivalent of DIFUS, or did they change the name of DIFUS in New Jersey? DIFUS is now uh, uh, Division of Child Protection and Permanency. DCP and P. Okay, but then there was a three-letter one. DCF is the Department of Children and Families. So, okay, it's, so it's, how do they fit together? So you have the Department of Children and Families, and within the department you have the Division of Child Protection and Permanency, which is formerly DIFUS, and you also have CSOC, C-S-O-C, which is the Children's System of Care, which is the treatment side. So there's the protection side and placement side, and then there's the treatment side. And does that organization also handle foster care in New Jersey? Division of um, Child Protection and Permanency is foster care too. Yeah. So, and again, these kids are, you know, all have prior histories with DCF. And, you know, when we started doing this, DCF was saying, human trafficking is not our problem. It's not abuse or neglect. It's our problem when parents are abusing their kids. And, you know, we started, we just started training DIFUS workers at the time all around the state anyway. And 
before long, uh, in the up, as we were approaching the Super Bowl up in North Jersey, there was a big push from law enforcement to do a lot of training, and finally, um, Allison Blake, the commissioner of DCF, sort of just completely changed direction and understood these are our kids. These are kids, you know, they used to call the kids that would go missing runaways. And they don't even use that term anymore. Now they talk about them as missing because they don't know where they went. They don't know why they left. And very often what they're finding is they, they leave because they're being coerced to leave by a pimp that they believe is to be their boyfriend. Um, so uh, substance abuse is not primary, but it does exist. Average age of entry is middle school. Middle school kids uh, are being coerced and are leaving home in the middle of the night, turning tricks after school, uh, and it's all on back page, and it's happening right under our very noses. Uh, Department of Justice estimates that one third of all missing youth will be lured or at least uh, an attempt to coerce them into trafficking it occurs within 48 hours. Yes? Backpage, what the heck is that? Is that on the dark internet? No, 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 no. Backpage, Backpage is owned by Village Voice Media, and I think they're probably making about $28 million a year on adult service ads. It's an online classified ad, okay? You can go on Backpage and buy a lawnmower or furniture or sex. And Backpage has recently been charged in California with human trafficking. And so what they did is they, they posted that their adult services, escort service ads, are being censored. But all of those ads just moved over to the dating page. Women seeking men, you know? And so the ads are still there, they're just in a different category. And they still exist. But if you just Google Backpage.com, South Jersey, uh, dating, you will see ads for escorts. And very often you'll see pictures that have the face blocked off, and they'll say, oh, you know, 22 years old. It's like, those are often the kids. Law enforcement actually, there's, a, there's an app, I have it on my phone. Um, I can take a picture of every hotel room that I ever go in and it automatically goes into a national database. And law enforcement can look at a back page ad and by looking at the furniture, the, uh, the bed linens, the covers and the things, they can figure out what hotel kids are in because they have so much data. And you can get that app, it's free. So it's a way to crowdsource yeah. the, this database. The database of, of tracking missing kids in hotels. Um, we do a project, uh, and I think there's probably a flyer for one. Uh, we just do a, a, a program we call Soap It Up. Soap is Stop Our Adolescent Prostitution. And it was the organization was founded by Teresa Flores, who is a survivor uh, who now lives in Ohio, uh, but she was trafficked as a teenager out of her home uh, in parts of Ohio and Michigan, and she made it to school almost every day after being out and turning tricks from roughly 11 o'clock at night until 3 or 4 in the morning. And her dad was a traveling businessman, he was almost never home, and mom just slept right through it, never knew she was gone. Okay, So what they do is She'll come and she's a very dynamic speaker, way better than me. And uh, she'll do a, a presentation, she'll do a little bit of human trafficking training, and then they send you out in teams with bars of hotel soap that has a couple of the national hotline numbers on them, and they'll also send you out with um, missing persons uh, flyers from National Center for Missing and Exploited Youth, and you will go and talk to the hotel staff that you've been, you know, you have a team of four people, you get four hotels to go visit on your way home from the, uh, the workshop. And you just ask them to take the soap, ask them to look at the picture. Every time we've done this project, we have identified one of the missing kids from the flyers that day. Wow. 
Every time we've done it, we found somebody that was missing. So that when you look at our web page, um, and I hope you do, you know, you'll see when the next one's coming up. It's, we just did one in Camden, so the next one will probably be up north somewhere. Uh, we don't have a date firmed up, but but it's coming up, and it's it's free, and we'd love you to join us. Um, so yeah, one third of the missing kids get lured by a trafficker within 48 hours. There was a film done, uh, a sort of documentary, and they had girls, 15 or 16 years old, getting off a bus in the Port Authority bus terminal, right? And an unescorted 15 or 16 year old girl cannot make it from the bus to the street without getting solicited by someone who is presumed to be a pimp, starts hitting on the girl. She just can't go through the bus terminal unescorted without getting hit on by somebody. And the presumption is these are, these are traffickers or they're um, runners for pimps that are out trying to recruit. So I mentioned also, foster kids are very vulnerable. They feel objectified. They feel like they're only there to make money. Uh, they are not free to make their own choices. They feel isolated because they, I mean, the average foster kid attends six high schools before they graduate. Six. Can you imagine? How do you have relationships? How do you have, you know, how, do you, how do you connect with people? Uh, and some foster parents, frankly, you know, kid doesn't come home. They make one report, kid's, kid's gone missing, and they rent the bed out to the next kid. You know, those kids are go missing, they're not being looked for. And of course, life is continually unstable when you're involved with DCF. And again, you've also had a prior history of trauma, which affects your brain development. So you're not making the best decisions at all times. Um, so, DCF did turn around their course um, prior to the Super Bowl. They changed their policies and they started their own hotline. This slide's a little dated. Every county is represented, not 20 or 21, it's all 21. Um, and again, this is last year's numbers. So, they're up over 600 calls right now for human trafficking cases alone. Who were the traffickers? Well, they're often known by the victim. Uh, internationally, they're probably members of the same community. Nationally, they, they're, they're um, local people. They're going to speak native language as well as English. 80% of the time, as I mentioned, there's going to be some gang organization, gang ties. Uh, a lot of mom and pop organizations. Um, we know one survivor that's working with the Dream Catchers program, that's our victim services program statewide. And what she'll tell you is that her first trafficker was her mother who rented her out when she was five years old. What, what uh, role does the military play in trafficking? There is a lot of trafficking that goes on around military installations. I can't tell you how many kids from southern New Jersey have been recovered uh, over in Dover, Delaware. You know, but they get trafficked. And that's one of the things that traffickers will do if you're, especially old school, again, it's changing on the internet so quickly you can't even keep up with it. But the old school trafficking, you know, the pimp would always take the kid away from home away from their familiar comfort zone, better able to coerce and control them if, if you're, you know where you are and they don't even know where they are. But yeah, we've had lots of kids from southern New Jersey that wind up over by the, uh, the air base in, in Dover, Delaware. Um, and, you know, of course the military doesn't support trafficking, anymore, but you got, you know, young men uh, with cash and, you know, 48 hours leave. What are they going to do? Um, anyway, so who are the traffickers? And it is immediate family, 36% of the time. Boyfriends, which is code for pimp, 27% of the time. Other friends of the family, 14%. If you do the math, 
75% of the traffickers are known to the victims. Okay, so this is not just, I mean, I know of a case, uh, Gabriella from Elizabeth was literally kidnapped off the street at gunpoint and was trafficked down to Atlantic City that day. She was gorilla pimped, you know, a gun to the head, a roofie, a sex tape, and she was turned out uh, by complete strangers. But that is not normal. That's not typical. More typically, the victim is known, the, the trafficker is known to the victim at some level. Where do pimps recruit? Bus stations, metros, shelters, concerts, shopping malls, uh, juvenile court. I've seen pimps that work in the waiting area of juvenile court. And why not? The girls that are going to juvenile court are already a bit of a mess, right? They wouldn't go in court if they didn't have some problems, if they didn't have some vulnerabilities. You know? So we do see that. Shopping malls. A friend of mine by the name of uh, Holly Austin Smith is another survivor. She's from Tuckerton. Uh, she's living in Richmond, Virginia area now, doing, doing well. She has a book out, um, and I'd encourage you to, to pick it up if you can. But she was trafficked at the Shore Mall, no, Hamilton Mall, I'm sorry, down in Atlantic County, um, when she was in middle school. And she did have a prior history of some sexual abuse. Um, but not, I mean, it was a cousin, you know, when she was 11 or 12 and her cousin was like 15 or 16, there was some sexual contact, but she never reported it. But what happened with Holly is, you know, she was one of the more popular kids in middle school, in sixth grade. She was sort of with the in crowd. And then sometime between seventh and eighth grade, a switch clicked off. And she was suddenly on the outside looking in, no longer one of the popular kids. And when she was at the mall with her group of middle-aged friends, her body language showed that she was on the outside looking in. And the pimp noticed that and went right up to her. And pimps are great manipulators and great listeners. And he learned that she wanted to, to dance. And so he worked on it for about two weeks and finally got her to run away from home so he could take her dancing in Atlantic City. And she was turned out that night. Fortunately, she got arrested the first night walking on Pacific Avenue. And she only turned a couple of tricks and was not too, too, too horribly traumatized. Um, and she's doing very well right now. But yeah, she was recruited at Hamilton Mall. I mentioned Backpage, again, this slide's a little dated. They are up to about 28 million a year in profits from adult service ads. It's a classified ad web page. You can Google it, you can buy a lawnmower, or you can rent a girl, or a guy, whatever you like. It's all there. Yes? Is this the Village Voice? Village Voice. Affiliated with the newspaper? Yeah, Village Voice Media owns Backpage. Um, and again, there, there have been some recent charges brought against the, uh, the owners of Backpage, and they were charged with actually human trafficking. And one case was pretty much dismissed right out of hand for First Amendment issues. And then they, it's in California, they changed the, the way the complaint was drawn up, and it's still pending. Interesting to see which way that goes. Um, when I talk to law enforcement about it, it's, you know, it used to be Craigslist before Backpage. And so Craigslist eventually got shut down by police pressure, public pressure. They said, you know what, we're not doing this anymore. We're not doing adult service ads at all. So they just, they just stopped doing it. And the next day, all that internet business moved to Backpage. So we could shut down Backpage, and there's, there's lots of uh, abolitionists that think we should. We got to shut down Backpage. That's where all this business is occurring. The day they shut down Backpage, next page will pop up. You know, so law enforcement's like, you know, the devil you know might be better than the devil you don't. Backpage is cooperating to agree with law enforcement. So we'll see which way that goes. So. 
the recruitment, the boyfriending, old school, the pimp would, uh, would be the boyfriend for a while. It would take some time, a few days or even a few weeks, to seduce and coerce that kid into the life, as they call it. Um, but there's other forms of, of ways to manipulate and coerce a kid into prostitution. Uh, gorilla pimp that I mentioned is fast track, it's roofies, it's a gun to your head, it's a sex tape, and you're turned out in hours. Um, there's also modeling web pages that will promise you a life of riches and glamour, uh, but you got to do some nude shots first, and then once you get that going, you get yeah, have some means for um, sextortion or blackmail or extortion, whatever you want to call it. You can turn a kid out that way, and of course, once that kid turns that first trick, he or she is a whore. Nothing but a whore. That's all you're ever going to be, bitch. And that's all you hear. And that's drilled into you. And how do you go back to middle school when you get a whore? Yes. Sir. Why doesn't law enforcement answer these ads? When presented with the child, the child over there. They do. Okay, they do. Um, they do undercover operations a couple of nights a week uh, down in Atlantic City, where I, yeah, I, I know the guys and I, I work with them all the time. Um, and again, what they're doing, what they're focusing on is trying to make a case against the pimp or the trafficker. So what they do is they'll set up in a hotel room, um, they will solicit for an escort, and then they're going to have surveillance going on all over the place. They're going to they're going to see who drives that kid to the casino. They're going to see you know they're going to have the phone number, and all those phone numbers are in a database. And I said you know all the hotel rooms are in a database, so they can figure out. Which, and so they get the kid to come up and. Um, you know, she'll do a solicitation and, and they'll say, okay, we, we got you. But they're not interested in charging the kid. They're interested in getting the pimp. So they, they want to try and get that kid to testify against the pimp. Or at least what they can do is they make connections between the solici solicitation that occurs in the hotel room and they play it back via phone calls and phone records and things and they make that connection to the pimp. Because that original phone number that you call off the back page is probably yeah, going to go to the still take the child out of the circulation. Oh, they do. They, they do. But if that, again, that kid has been brainwashed. So the kid's not very often going to talk to law enforcement right away. They're going to deny everything. She's going to say she works alone, even though we know it's not true. Um, they're not going to arrest her and lock her up. They're not going to continue to victimize her that way. They understand she's being victimized, so they can't lock her up. They can't hold her. You know, uh, there are only about ten beds in the state of New Jersey that are specific for survivors of human trafficking. Again, I used to deal with them in the shelter, the runaway and homeless shelter, all the time. We would get between fifteen and thirty a year. Do you remember back in, I think it was 2007, there were those four murders in Atlantic City? Uh, there were four prostitutes that were murdered, right? That year, I had about 60 human trafficking victims come through the shelter. Any idea why? No, no. Vice was doing twice as many operations because they were trying to break that murder case. So they were out a little more vigorously, and the more they were out there, the more kids they were finding. You know, if they don't do the operation, the kids are out on the street and they're just out there. You know? So double the number of kids that year when law enforcement had doubled their efforts to, to look at it. Yeah? You're talking about kids in New Jersey what Um, there is not, a, there's much more labor trafficking of international victims into the United States. For example, there's a case in East Orange, and it was a hair braiding salon, and the woman who was a trafficker 
had figured out ways to manipulate the visa system. So she would go to East Africa, West Africa, West Africa, Nally, and she would recruit girls to do hair braiding. And then she would, she'd get them a visa to come over here. And of course, once they were here, you know, she took their passports, they paid her for the privilege of coming over here. She put them to work. They lived in utter squalor, like six to a bedroom on the floor. Uh, they worked double shifts every day. And she did it in a way that, that um, it, was, it resembled debt bondage. Because they all owed her a certain amount of money for the, the, the privilege of, she helped them get a visa. She gave them a job, she gave them a place to live, but she, they still had to pay for room and board and everything else, even though they didn't get anything. They got like, so six to a bedroom in a crappy apartment in East Orange. But um, yeah, she had dozens and dozens of girls. She even had some of her girls working for her competition in these hair braiding salons up in Essex County. Um, but that's what you see more internationally. And down in the South, of course, we see farm labor a lot. And, you know, if you ever get a, a pedicure, you know, check those licenses. Make sure they're real. They're not photocopied. Mm -hmm. Yes? What happens to the young girls after they've been identified by law enforcement? Well, um, ideally, they are willing to cooperate with law enforcement. And they would be connected with Dream Catchers, which is our victim services program. It's a, statewide program. It's based out of the Women's Center for Domestic Violence Shelter Program down in Atlanta County. Uh, but they now have six offices around the state. They have 24-hour coverage. So they'll go out anywhere in the state to connect with the victim. And you know, they begin to develop a relationship and rapport with those survivors. There are very limited beds for survivors of uh, sex trafficking in the state. I know DCF is looking to develop some more beds, uh, and there's a number of nonprofit organizations that are trying to, to sort of go out on their own and develop some, some housing options. Uh, but ideally, we're going to connect that kid with some really good trauma-informed care as quickly as possible. And, but you, know, you really just have to build the rapport. Um, these kids will invariably run away again. And that's my next question. How successful is that procedure? Um, I can't give you a, a number. Of, I mean, the success is in hanging in there with a the kid. The success is, is in having that rapport with a kid. So, you know, when... Having one, one person who cares about Right. That's not going to exploit you. So when the girl that that girl I mentioned that by the time she was 13 or 14 was a bottom bitch. I mean, I knew her since she was 11. And when she was 14, she was still a hot mess. But every time she ran away, we'd welcome her back and ask if she was okay. And tell her, you know, you can do better. You don't have to be out there working, you know. Um, and eventually she got it. Eventually, I mean, after years of mess, years of, of angst and anxiety, years of where she was recruiting and she was putting other kids at harm, we never gave up on her. And eventually, you know, um, she started to do okay. And, and she, she stayed. I mean, it's basically what you have to do. You have to you just stay and try to build a life. Yes. Are there any of those beds in Tom's River, New Jersey? Uh, the tent are, that you said? No, the, the program is um, Community Treatment Solutions. They call it their BASE program, and I forget what the BASE <laughs> acronym stands for. But um, they, have, they are specialized foster homes. So the beds are scattered throughout southern New Jersey. They're in private homes. Oh. And the, the, the homeowners, the parents in those homes, have, have agreed to some very specialized training uh, to deal with this very, very difficult, very specialized population. Harbor House in Tom's River certainly gets trafficking victims on a regular basis. Really? In the show. Oh, sure. Uh, they're a runaway homeless youth shelter just like, you know, we had... I'm familiar with the shelter. Yeah. But I didn't know whether that was... 
Yeah, they have they have federal funding. They have a, what's called a basic center grant. Um, so it's a runaway homeless youth walk-in shelter. And the reality is that uh, in the real world, the runaway and homeless youth that are on the street that, that just might show up uh, at a hotel in Seaside over the summer, right, uh, are probably trafficking victims. You know, I would say that 80 or 90% 80 or of the kids that, that I ever placed under those federal guidelines were trafficking victims. And the Toms River Police, have they been educated in this kind of... All law enforcement agencies have had some degree of training in trafficking. The attorney, yeah, the Attorney General's office has been doing this since uh, 2005. They've been going around, and, and Kathy Fries is their trainer. She does every law enforcement agency that will have her. And they're starting to put human trafficking components in you know, the, the police academies and things like that. As so well. it's not required. Uh, you know what, it probably is required to the letter of the law. How much of it you get, it varies. Um, but, I mean, the change I've seen since early 2000s to now has been very, very dramatic. Again, you know, early on, before we knew what human trafficking was, you know, the old school cops is like, prostitutes are prostitutes, just breaking the law and going to arrest them. I said, wait a minute, this is a 14-year-old kid. She did not make this choice. She did not elect to go out. I mean, ladies, gentlemen, how many of you consider being a sex worker as a career option? <laughs> Anybody? In 12 years of doing these trainings, nobody's ever raised their hand. Nobody makes that choice. All right? Yes? Some countries have uh, decriminalized prostitution. How much of a solution is that for the situation? I'm going to just sit for a second because my back is hurting. But um, the Swedish program, right? Sweden has, dec you cannot be arrested for, uh, for prostitution in Sweden. You can be arrested for soliciting prostitution in Sweden. So the idea is, okay, so the women are decriminalized and the guys can be arrested. Well, the human trafficking in Norway just doubled. And it went it cut in half in Sweden. So it just moved across the border. Um, the reality is, it's exploitation. It's always exploitation. Even for example, people think that prostitution is legal in, in, in Las Vegas. It is not. There are two or three legal ranches up in the Reno area where prostitution is legal. And there have been some studies done. And the women that are involved in legal prostitution in Nevada are still feeling compelled to do it. It sucks. They hate it. They have to meet a quota to make their rent because they have to pay rent now because they're in a very secure building. You know, so they're still working, 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 um, you know, turning tricks with ugly, smelly guys that they would never want to be with ever, and that's their job now. So they're still feeling very, very, very much exploited, and 90% of them say they would leave that life now if they had a way out. They would leave immediately. Okay? Can I just follow up because I don't know they got the answer to the question. It's a very good question. In those countries where prostitution is legal. Yes. Okay. And in some countries it's even no profession. Um, what is the effect on human trafficking? And specifically the subject of your talk today, the exploitation of minors. What is the effect there? Is it less than that effect? There is a direct court there's a direct um, correlation between the size and scope of any legal sex industry and the underground illegal sex industry behind it. So, you know, New Jersey has over 2,000 strip clubs. Did you know that? And we are densely populated with strip clubs. And all of them have pimps and their victims nearby. You know, it's, I mean, if guys are going to strip clubs, they're going to get horny. They may want to solicit a prostitute afterwards. So it's, there's access there. That industry is, is nearby. It's close at hand. And 
those, those statistics hold up worldwide, where there is legal sex work going on, there is a, a, a portion of illegal sex work behind it. Um, so even where, you know, it might be legal for an adult to be a prostitute in, in some areas, there's still guys that don't want kids. They don't want the young ones. There was a study one time that was done by the Shapiro Group uh, in, in the Atlanta area. And what they did was they wanted to see what kind of, what guys were looking for that solicited sex. So they set up a false ad on Backpage and a phone number. And so guys that wanted to solicit for an escort would call the number and they would get an operator. And the operator said, well, we want to make sure we connect you with the right person. So, you know, what are you looking for? Are you looking for black or white or blonde or brunette, tall, short, you know, uh, how old do you want? And one of the things they found is like, all these guys were calling and they're saying, well, I would like someone who is like 18 years old today. Because I would never want to solicit for, you know, an underage girl. That would be jailbait. That would be wrong. I have scruples. So 18 and a minute, you know. So that's what they're looking. They're looking for younger and younger girls. And the, the assumption with that is there's this perception that like the younger you are, the less likely it is you're going to have some kind of disease, you know. So it's safer to have sex with a younger kid. Uh, so the life begins and kids are turned out. Again, more and more gorilla pimping going on these days. Uh, and it's, it's humiliating. So victims do not self-identify, um, whether it's for religious reasons or just the, the immorality of it all. Uh, they have also been told very clearly by the pimp, again, this pimp is going to love her and be the boyfriend and be all those wonderful things. Once she turns out, okay, the game changes. And now you're a money maker and you got to follow the rules. And, you know, there's a lot of rules. You can't, um, talk to law enforcement, you can't talk to other pimps, um, you know, there's going to be a video, this video is going to get posted, I'm going to send it to your family, I might kill your family, I might kill your dog, uh, you know, if you try to go against me, you're not allowed to leave. And, you know, so these kids are, are traumatized, and so we see absolute signs of trauma bonding, uh, what we call the Stockholm Syndrome, where the captives identify with their captors and sort of stick with them. Um, because of the trauma, again, you're going to see very often flat emotional affect. Uh, kids are going to downplay their health problems. You know, they're going to get away. They, want, they don't want to deal with anyone of authority, whether that's law enforcement, social services, health services. Um, they just want to get back to the pimp so they don't get another beating. And so these are the, some of the toughest cases that law enforcement and social services deals with because these kids are so traumatized. And the only thing you can do is, is you have to build that relationship of trust over time. So eventually you can pull them back in. Yes? Yeah. Uh, are they uh, giving drugs? Uh, Sometimes. And get, you know, and then get them, the, get them hooked on drugs. Is there a correlation between drug trafficking and... and there, drugs are usually not a primary component in a pimp's stable. I mentioned earlier this guy in, in Jersey City who was a, a heroin dealer, and he did, in fact, purposefully get his girls addicted to heroin. And so they would have to turn a certain quota of tricks, and then they would get a bag. They would get some heroin. They would get their relief. And that was his method. But that's expensive because he had to keep the heroin supply going. Um, so drugs are usually not primary. Now, in gorilla pimping, roofies are used very often. You know what a roofie is, right? That's the date rape drug. So they'll just give the kid a couple of roofies and rape that kid and videotape it and say, you're, you're going to turn tricks now. This is what you're going to do. And if you don't do it, you know, I'm either going to shoot you or I'm going to post this video to your family or both. So, you know, you have a job to do now. Yes? 
So when a child does leave, yeah. for whatever reason, does the pimp indeed carry out the threats of video and so on and so forth? Roxy Lopez was 15 when I met her. She was a beautiful girl from out on Long Island, and she was really, really smart. Um, and this was before I started working with the FBI and really, really doing the background stuff. So I had her in one of my basic center beds, federally funded bed, and the rules of those beds were you send kids back where they came from, if they're a runway. So she was, a, she was picked up by AC Vice, sent to the shelter. She was fully cooperative, very nice. Where are you from? She told me where she's from. Gave me her grandmother's phone number, called the grandmother. Yes, I'm her grandmother. Is she okay? Oh, can you help her come home? And it's like, yes, we can. Uh, she wanted to go home. Boom, boom, boom. Got her home. Uh, turned out that grandmother was really the pimp's mother. Two weeks later, her body was located in a dumpster outside a strip club in Baltimore because the pimp thought that she spoke with law enforcement when we had her throat. So he killed her. I have a question. Yeah. Um, you said that the pimp didn't MS-13 yeah. definitely runs Latino brothels, you know, and I'm not getting into that because I'm, I'm not Latino and I don't speak Spanish, you know, it's like not an option for me. But, you know, there are Latino brothels that are servicing the Latino population. Um, there are African American, most pimps tend to be uh, in, in the East, more often African American. Uh, mostly, but not all. Um, in the West, more Latino pimps. Um, but, you know, when you go on Backpage, uh, you know, you can, you can solicit for whatever ethnicity you want. Um, in Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, there is very, very high demand for blonde-haired, blue-eyed American girls, and that demand comes from traveling businessmen from Japan. They, they want the blonde-haired American beach girl. That's, you know, but whatever you want is out there. This is America. You can buy whatever you want, right? Uh, so we talked about trauma bonding and, and some kids not self-identifying. Uh, other flags, um, this is more geared towards some school-based people, but like, we had this one girl, and she would disappear every Thursday. She'd show back up on Monday or Tuesday. She always had beautiful new hair. She always had great, beautiful nails. She was always done up very nicely. She was completely exhausted and dehydrated, because all she did was got, she got dolled up on Thursday. She worked all weekend. She didn't even have time to eat or drink. And then she'd, she'd be back. Um, she usually had a cell phone that she couldn't really tell you where she got it. Uh, she often had hotel pass, you know, those pass cards. Uh, that's another indicator. And, you know, she's like, oh, it's my boyfriend all weekend. We, we were just having fun. Uh, and she was working in casinos all weekend. She also, um, she had a very interesting uh, brand tattoo that we'll get to in a minute. Again, those missing on Monday and Friday is a definite indicator. But, uh, you know, we call it modern day slavery. So the concept is these kids are owned by their pimp. And, you know, what do you do with something that you own? You put your name on it, right? You brand it. Um, so this pimp's name is Boss. This girl, by the way, is from Cape May. And she ran away from a group home up in, up here in Monmouth County, I believe. 
and turned 20 tricks the first week she left the group home. Can anybody tell me what this girl's pimp, pimp's street name might be? Any guesses? Ever. Yeah. Um, and by the way, pimps have a street name, Maverick, or you can call him Daddy. They never ever use their real name. So even when law enforcement is interviewing a cooperative survivor, she can't tell them who her pimp was. It's Maverick. Well, what's his real name? I don't know. It's Maverick. That's all she knows. Daddy. Daddy's name is Maverick. There's Richie's girl. This next guy has quite an ego. His street name is God. And Blessed and Diva and Golden One and Property and Blessing and Secret. These are all street names of different girls in his stable. This guy had a day job. He was a guidance counselor in Reading, Pennsylvania. He also was 49 years old. All of his girls were middle school age girls. He test drove all of them. He fathered 14 children with 10 different middle school girls and turned them all out. It's like I had given away my soul in exchange for mine. If it wasn't for me having a child, I would have killed myself by now. I'm so disgusted with myself. And suicide is probably attempted among about 70% of trafficking victims at some point. They do not know how to get out of the mess they're in. And suicide seems like the best option. And a lot of them are successful, unfortunately. Again, this is sort of designed for some school-based people, uh, but these are some phrases of the life Breaking a bitch is when the bitch has to break down and give all her money to a pimp. They break every, a couple of times a night, give up all their cash. They're not allowed to carry cash, uh, and they don't keep any of the money. The pimp gets all the money. Uh, folks or family is another term for the stable or the group of girls that all work for one pimp. Uh, what you doing in Atlantic City, sweetie? Oh, I'm down with my fam. I'm, you know, here with my wifeies. Uh, so folks and fam and family are just that stable. Gorilla Pimp and I've mentioned a couple of times, this is the sort of fast track, brutal approach. A couple of roofies, date rape drugs, rape the kid, take the photos, put a gun to her head, turn a trick. Once you turn a trick, you're a whore, that's it. You've graduated. <coughs> and that's all you're ever going to be. Uh, track or stroll, that's the old school location where, you know, you would have street walking going on. That old. Uh, Julia Roberts style street walking that you saw that doesn't exist really anymore. Very little. So a little occurs very late at night, you know, after all the appointments from the escorts are done. You go out on the stroll and make a few extra bucks. But most of it's done on the internet, by phone, by appointment, in calls or out calls. Uh, wifey, wife-in-law. In the, in the fam, all the girls are somehow symbolically married to the pimp. So if there's four girls in, in the stable, there's four wives to the pimp. So the wife, the girls are wife-in-laws to one another, right? Doesn't that make perfect sense? Right? And that's their turn. So